two, one. Welcome to Real Hospitality Live, live on LinkedIn, Periscope, YouTube Live, broadcasting around the planet. I am so excited to have my good friend join us today. This man is an advocate, an activist, an educator, an inspiration. Minto Roy is the managing partner of a company out of New Westminster, British Columbia called Social Print. And Minto, welcome and thank you for coming on. We, I, I, had, a, I, had, I had an introduction set up to, to put forth, but you know what I want to do? I want it to be the first question. Three million trees every day cut down in North America for paper and packaging. 1.1 billion per year. Yeah. I, 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 not only am I speechless when I read this, just yesterday I read that in India they, they plant, they're planting 400 million uh, trees per year. 400 million trees per year is not keeping up with 1.1 billion. What, do we, what, what, what the hell are we doing? Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for us, especially in business, to redefine a lot of the biases that are out there, that paper and packaging needs to be made using trees or wood fiber. In fact, that's not true. Um, agricultural fiber paper has been around for thousands of years. The Egyptians made papyrus, uh, a type of paper, uh, parchment paper. Um, but obviously it didn't look and feel like today's paper or packaging. Um, but we've come a long way, you know, agricultural fiber has been used uh, by many other countries for paper. So what we've done over the last several years at Social Print is make paper using agricultural fiber waste that looks, feels, and performs just like paper from tree fiber. And you're right, uh, you know, billions of trees are cut down every single year to make paper and packaging. And I think it's important that we take this time now to rechange how people think about paper, that you, you just don't need trees to make paper and packaging anymore because trees are such a vital part of our ecosystem. We have such a symbiotic relationships uh, with trees as humans. You know, we release carbon dioxide, they release oxygen, we need what they release and they need what we release. So, you know, there's a stat that says only 15% of the original forests remain in this world. Um, and I think it's important that we look at how can we minimize deforestation, but also the release of carbon emissions that happen when we take down trees. So, I mean, obviously, I mean, what you're representing is, a, is an alternative. And uh, Sugar Sheet, which you see the package behind you. Yeah. <laughs> so when we talk about Sugar Sheet as an alternative, what's Sugar Sheet? So sugar sheet is paper that's made with the residue waste of sugarcane fiber called bagasse. Bagasse is the remaining fiber after a sugarcane plant is harvested for food, alcohol, biofuels, and sugars. The remaining residue byproduct is called bagasse. So instead of that bagasse going to landfill sites or being burned into the atmosphere by farmers, creating further carcinogens in the atmosphere, we take a waste fiber, the fiber called bagasse, and make our sugar sheet paper out of it. Um, so it's a true uh, waste byproduct. It advances the circular economy. And the best thing is it just doesn't use any trees or forests. So when we talk about paper, I mean, you, you, so you have a package of copier paper behind you. and yeah. So what, what applications can you do? I mean, it, when the, the, the layman, when, the, when they hear, oh, we're making paper out of, out of sugar sheet and, and we're, we're making this bagasse, they're expecting to find this in some specialty store where the ladies are going in and getting their crafting products and there's still some grain in it and it's a little bit soft, almost cottony. And, and you know, this is something that, uh, you know, as a, as a craft product, but really it, 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 the, the grade of this is, is outstanding. So, well, well, thanks. And, and Jason, um, 
You know, when we first started this venture, the, the goal was not just to make an environmentally friendly paper. The goal was to make a paper that looked, performed, felt exactly like traditional paper. As importantly, a paper that was priced as competitively as traditional wood fiber paper. You know, for the last 30 or 40 years, sustainable products have gone to the consumer market and, and asked for the added value of sustainability. Jason, you're gonna have to pay more or you're gonna have to sacrifice quality and performance. It was really important friendly paper, but made one that didn't ask the consumers, whether business consumers, or retail consumers, or government consumers, to sacrifice quality, paper performance, or pay a premium to uh, integrate the value of sustainability within their operations. But equally as important, when you mentioned going to a specialty craft store, it was really incumbent upon us as a business to make it as easy as possible for consumers out there to procure sugar sheet paper. So that meant establishing distribution partnerships with people like Staples, Grand & Toy, regional distributors like Likey or Hamster or Monk's Office Supply in, in Victoria, in, in Vancouver Island. You know, so that when we met with customers and tried to get them to be aware of sugar sheet and its applications to, to support their environmental commitments, that it was as easy to procure a sugar sheet as it is to procure their current traditional wood fiber paper. Well, that takes the, it takes the guesswork as to where to find it. It's in London Drugs too, right? Correct. Uh, we are very proud that not only does London Drugs use it in their operations in Canada, but London Drugs proudly distributes sugar sheet paper in all their 85 plus stores across Western Canada. That's correct. So applications for it, I mean, it's a copier paper, but you're also doing brochures, you're doing menus, you're doing uh, uh, just, just about everything that you can do with paper, right? Absolutely. In the applications of Sugar Sheet, we've expanded our portfolio of agricultural paper to now include paper of different weights, sizes, different coatings. So the applications for the food services and trees can, it can uh, support menus, uh, envelopes, invoices, brochures, uh, packaging, you know, for takeout food. So really our, our goal is wherever the application of wood fiber paper is being used to support paper and packaging, we can use agricultural fiber waste to provide the same quality standards that they need for their operations, but support business and professionals and their commitment to supporting the environment within their operations. Well, I mean, that's not just a catchphrase anymore. It's a reality, right? When we talk, yeah. about, when we talk about sustainability, we talk about environment for such a long time. It's been, oh, sustainable. Everybody's just, everybody wants to be this. And it's a, it, it's a, it's a conversation that's uh, very short lived because it seems to be a, a, a big brother, be, big brother speak catchphrase. But when we talk about, the trees themselves. I mean, it's it's not just the trees. It's the it's the uh, the additional footprint, the additional carbon footprint. And I know that organizations that that come on board with you can have an opportunity to to find out how how much or how how, how much they've reduced their carbon footprint just in in changing the way that they operate with with the. With the That's a great. It's a great uh, point, Jason, because. We see sustainability as not only the right thing to do, but as a, as a significant competitive business advantage. Consumers across industry are now asking um, for sustainable solutions. Consumers are looking to do business with companies that have strong environmental commitments, strong social commitments. And what we've done with our Sugar Sheet brand is we've done two comprehensive life cycle assessments. They've been done by an organization called True Cost. True Cost is a leading environmental global audit firm. They did a comparative study comparing the production of our sugar sheet paper to that of the production of virgin, 30% recycled, and 100% recycled wood fiber papers. Comparing the production, sorry, comparing the release of CO2 during production, comparing the use of trees during production, and comparing the use of water during production. And the life cycle assessment conducted by TrueCost concluded that 
When producing sugar sheet, in comparison, it releases less CO2 emissions. It uses no trees. Right. And it uses less water because the strands of the sugarcane fiber are shorter than wood fiber, therefore less, requiring less water for breakdown. So for every client that we have that switches to sugar sheet paper, we can then provide them a measurable eco-savings report showcasing how much CO2 and how much trees they've actually saved by making the switch. Now, are able to leverage data and drive initiatives like marketing, um, PR, uh, they can project an employer of choice identity, they can uh, do compliance reporting with it. So really leveraging the value of sustainability as a competitive business tool to drive business value for their customers and stakeholders. So we talked about different businesses using it. I mean, our first conversation ever was about bringing this in and changing the way the hospitality industry works and, and, and the way that we go through paper because we go through it like it's, it's outrageous. The, the amount of paper that we go through, whether or not it's, it's copier paper, printer paper, menu paper, billing, uh, uh, flyers, you name it. It's, we're, we are huge offenders. And it's, again, mind boggling the amount of paper that we go through. You don't, you wouldn't think that unless you talked about napkins, but right. side of that, the, there's the, then there's the dark side of it as well. Um, where we, as a, as, as a industry are oftentimes, um, even going for, uh, uh, paper that's, that's not, um, not claimed sustainably like we're we're we will go and get uh you know the, the cheapest uh paper out of out right. of for example right and that's and that's a conversation i want to have with you too i mean is this is not a north american problem always it's this is this is a you know where where does this other paper come from in, in comparison because we we don't know where we're, what we're buying for the most part we're we're saying well so and so can do it cheaper but where is this coming from yeah, you know, I had a great conversation with uh, the federal government. The federal government recently selected Sugar Sheet as their eco-friendly paper of choice in the 2019 bid for copy paper. And I had a really interesting question asked by someone who said, hey, Minto, uh, when is this paper going to be made in Canada? And I said, that's a great question. You know, I said, uh, in Canada, we produce agricultural fiber but we don't produce agricultural fiber pulp for the production of fine copy paper or fine papers. Um, but the more importantly I asked, is your question when is it gonna be produced in Canada or when is it gonna be produced in Canada at the same price as it's produced now? Because if you take a look around all of our offices, very little is ever produced in Canada. I mean, my iPhone, if my iPhone was made in Vancouver, it would cost $20,000, Jason, and right. it would be price competitive. Right. The vast majority of things around my office, surrounding your office, are not made in Canada. Yeah. And I think it's important to realize that the majority of problems that we're having in this world, you know, whether it's gender equality, whether it's women's rights, whether it's education, whether it's poverty, whether it's hunger, whether it's the environment, these are all global problems. And it will take a global mindset and collective partnerships on a global level to really solve it. I mean, I live in Vancouver. It is so beautiful. Actually, Canada is so beautiful that it's easy to forget that there are many countries in this world that there are sunny days, but there are no blue skies. I just came back from China and Korea and India. These are all places that have haze and smog and air pollutant problems. And if we don't think that that's going to permeate to our atmosphere sooner or later, I think we're, we're a bit delusional. That's inevitable. We're just so fortunate to live in a, a country uh, that has an amazing climate, but we need to be stewards to protect that climate, not only for us, but for people around the world. You know, I, I just saw a picture two days ago um, of LA in the 70s uh, before they changed their, actually it might have even been closer to the 80s, uh, before they changed their Environmental um, and Pollution Act. And mm -hmm. you, you couldn't see down to the end of the block. There were three people standing on the sidewalk and there was a building in, in, in just a haze. And the same thing happened in Vancouver, for example, when, uh, when the big bus strike in 2001, you could see above the city, the haze of, and, and we're, we're moving to a place 
uh, as a society where where we're well aware of this now. We we don't we don't have any more excuses. No, I agree. and you know, Jay, um, I think there's an opportunity not only to integrate sustainability into people's careers. I don't care what career you're going into. The environment is going to become a relevant part of that career in terms of its activities and responsibilities. So shrewd companies are actually redefining job descriptions to inculcate the environment as a part of someone's activity practice to deepen engagements with their internal and external st stakeholders. And I think that's really where we need to go. See, just like in the restaurant and food industry, things like vegetarianism or veganism in the food industry, just like the environment, has always been communicated on the right thing to do, guilt, obligation. Well, if, if you're going to always make people feel guilty or obligated, I think they're going to want to stop talking to you sooner or later. So it's really important that we do more than create interest in sustainability. We want to create urgency. And competitive urgency happens by people recognizing it. Wow, this could be a huge advantage if I use agricultural fiber paper. I'll give you a, great, a few great examples. I had a client uh, two years ago, they switched their contracts that they signed with their customers to sugar sheet paper. And he implemented, had his sales staff implement one phrase at the end when he's asking people to sign on the dotted line. He said, tell their customers, or tell the customers, by the way, that agreement you're about to fill out, it's made with sugar sheet. It's 100% agricultural fiber waste instead of trees. It's our commitment to work with our clients to, uh, reduce the impact in the environment. What he told me was customers would take the contract, put it in their hands and say, hey, that's really cool. And it helped increase their closing ratio by 20% because it was an interjection of a core value at a time where decisions are being made to solidify a partnership that was values-based rather than transaction-based. You know. I've had clients call, contact me and say, hey, we make our invoices off with sugar sheet. And I've had a few customers call me and say, hey, how cool is your invoice uh, that you sent me? It's made out of agricultural fiber waste. And customers saying to me, Minto, people are thanking me for sending them an invoice because they think it's cool. Yeah. That's, that's, that's shrewd integration of sustainability to add value. So and you and I talked about this yesterday really quick, but I wanted to, to kind of put it, put it back on the table so we could do this live. So why not? What are, what are, what are, what are some objections that, that people say, well, you know, why, why, why same price, easy to get it. Why not? What are, what are, what are, what are, what are, what are some of the things that, that, that people say? I mean, because I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, as a, uh, like I say, as a, as a, as a lay person and, you know, just if, if I didn't know anything about this, this is, I, I, I would, I would always try and make up some manner of, of, of objection, but why not? Why, 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 there's, there's no reason not to go with it, this, this direction. I think the big part of it has to do with education. There's a lot of biases that agricultural fiber paper is not a good quality. And there's some truth to that. 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, agricultural fiber products were brought to the marketplace and they didn't perform properly. Um, Incadesian problems or there was curling inside of equipment. But we've eliminated all those biases in terms of paper performance. Our paper has been tested by uh, major brands like Rico and Xerox for runnability and performance. We work closely with all the major OEMs, including Rico, Xerox, HP, Konica Minolta. Uh, we support print centers. We have thousands and thousands of clients across the country using sugar sheet paper. All of them use different equipment. And knock on wood, over the last five, six years, we've had no problems with our paper not performing effectively. So that was one bias that we have to overcome. Two, just awareness. Uh, you know, making sure people are educated that uh, you can get paper that looks, performs, and it's the same quality and the same price as traditional wood fiber paper. And, and also three, I think this is a really uh, challenging one for any positive disruption in the marketplace. 
traditional incumbents who are currently, let's say the distributors or the big uh, companies that currently have the market share in paper or oil and gas or pharmaceuticals have tremendous leverage and advocacy with supply chains, with government uh, rebates, with uh, massive spend for advertising promotion. So, you know, it, it's not easy to compete against the traditional incumbents. Right. You know, it's a real opportunity for us to bring greater awareness and, and drive up the use of agricultural fiber paper. Because the one thing we do know, I believe 99.9% .9 of people, if they could implement something environmentally friendly within the organization, and they didn't have to sacrifice quality or pay a premium, I, I believe they would do it. And, and I think that's what's so inspiring to me is that we're presenting something that really is in align with what we believe people want to see happen in this world. Right. I think this movement and, and change um, is, is, is obvious and it's coming. And, and again, um, we've had this conversation about, you know, people, people want to, people want to change. They don't necessarily know how they want it to be convenient. And they also want to know who else is doing it. Um, I mean, you're, you're working with large groups, large organizations, you're working with government organizations. Um, so who's, who's using it? It's a great question. So as I mentioned, the federal government of Canada is using it. Uh, major universities like UBC, uh, BCIT, uh, major government organizations, provincial, the uh, provincial health authority on all of Vancouver Island has converted all their use of uh, copy paper to sugar sheet paper. So uh, London Drugs, uh, BC TransLink. Um, so we have some incredibly large uh, customers that are committed to environmental stewardship. But we're also inspired by a lot of smaller companies, you know, uh, restaurant chains. Uh, we've got um, uh, hospitality uh, uh, industry uh, businesses. We've got event centers. Uh, school boards. Um, there's an organization called BC Net, which is a buying group for major schools in Western Canada who are now advancing the greater awareness and use of sugar sheet paper for all their members. So right. I think they're doing it because it does align with their values as it relates to minimizing the environmental impact uh, within their operations. So I really think it's important for other businesses that are out there um, that it's not enough just to make us an environmentally friendly product or service, but I think it's important that you become very active in the communities that you serve. You know, if I can, we did something extremely important, but it, it was born out of our naivety or stupidity. When we first developed the sugar sheet product, um, Jason, I didn't know much about um, the environmental communities. Um, so initially all we did was jump into the communities. We started to volunteer, listen, learn, attend events with academic, government, industry uh, leaders and professionals. We got a chance to listen and learn a lot of things. That, that evolved to the opportunity of sharing ideas and best practices. That then evolved uh, for us to have the opportunity to develop new ideas, share some new ideas about best practices, facilitate introductions with other people that we had met to new people coming into the communities. And that then evolved to us speaking at industry conferences like the Globe Conference, Sustainable Brands Conference, the Conference Board of Canada Conference, the Teachers Federation Conference, to being a media voice. But we really built our organization and our brand through the genuine and consistent participation of the community versus a transactional product. But honestly, we didn't know we were doing that. We were just too we were just too naive and needed to learn a lot. So thank God for how dysfunctional we were in the beginning because it prompted us to need to learn well, to, to build our brand. To speak to that, and I don't know if you saw this, but when we were at the um, BC Food Processors trade show this yeah. last year, and I and I arrived just as just as you took the stage. 
and I stood at the back. And this, and the reason why I bring this up is because I, 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 I want to hit home the, what people are really thinking. They're not necessarily taking action yet, but this is what they're thinking. When you finish talking, yeah. there were people in the back standing by me, weeping, crying, emotional about this and I'm not talking about people who just get emotional about anything. This hit people audacity like that. You know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. The, the audacity to ask for people's time and attention is, is something you should never take for granted. I, I whether there's one person listening to this uh, uh, video interview or there's a million, it doesn't matter. It's incumbent upon you and I to make sure they get value for that time. This isn't not about me and my product. This is about, you know, the relationship about sustainability as a competitive business advantage and the alignment to the values of the people that are listening. And what, what can we do uh, from our failures and our successes to pass on information so that others can develop their careers, grow their businesses? That's what we're hoping to do. And the same thing, you know, the BC food processors industry is an incredibly important industry. These people are producing food and they have a big commitment to producing healthy food, nutritious food, for the health and well-being of their customers. But how the food is packaged, how the food is, food is communicated on customer facing materials, pamphlets, we have an opportunity to be relevant to support that other value which we know is close to that organization with those individuals. Right. So, they have the, so they have the opportunity to be re uh, relevant and provide them with insight to support them is, is what we're always trying to achieve. Um, and I appreciate you saying that. Well, I, 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 it's been, it's literally been sitting here and, and I wanted, and, and I haven't had the opportunity to tell you, uh, but it, it was, it was such a, a moment that I thought, wow, you know, these, these people really get it. Like they're, they're, they're really moved in there and they're now informed. And now, hopefully, they can make informed decisions. I mean, I guess the so so the question now is so what do you what do you see as as the as the the future of these products and 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 where this is going? I mean, I know this is this is now uh, a, an unstoppable uh, landslide of of change. What what, do you, what are your what are your thoughts on on industries uh, adopting and and where do you where do you see this going? That, that's a very important question but it's a complex question because I think today if you think about the relationship between consumers and businesses uh, consumers today can buy any product any service without ever interfacing with a business right. think about it. 30 years ago you and I needed to buy a stereo perhaps we got up on a Saturday we went to two, three, maybe four, if we were really industrious stereo stores, checked out what they had, compared the experience, compared prices, made a decision. Today, I can get up in the morning with my iPhone, have a cup of coffee, have 20 different quotes for stereos, not go anywhere. I do not even have to talk to a business. So the new exchange between consumers and businesses has made us all selling, we're all selling commodities. The only way to customize your commodity now is by the experience that you create with the interface. So you gotta ask yourself as a business, if you're presenting the same narratives or communications as every other business in your industry, how are you adding value to the consumer out there? Or are you just selling a commodity? And what I see in, you know, I try to be so candid in trying to dispense advice out there. I, to me, I see the world right now competing most businesses by doing the same thing better or the wrong thing better. If you take a look at most consumers, the frustration they have when we're consumers is that everybody else always says the same thing. Hey, we've got a great quality product. We've got great customer service. We've got a competitive price. We've been in business for 10, 20, 30 years. Those are all given standards now, Jason. You know, so... This, the, the adaptation or the integration of sustainability 
as a part of your operations, as a part of your products and services, as a part of your communication protocol really is a powerful differentiator that aligns with the values of consumers. And it's a powerful differentiator that will add value and a reason for customers to engage with you and not just buy stuff off the internet or have to choose between everybody who's saying the same thing. I, and I saw that firsthand with, with menus for our restaurants um, where people would, be, people would be reading the menu and see at the bottom printed on sugar sheet. And, and it became a conversation where, where we, we would have a, uh, a same values conversation and, and, and it was a common ground thing with, with guests. And people would be like, wow, what, what, what is this? What does this mean? And the, it, it's just another reason for those people to come back or those people to remember, those people to, to, to understand that uh, we also want to be a responsible company. And that is another plus on top of all of the, we've been in business, we've, you know, this is we've competitive pricing, you know, sourcing products, yada, yada, yada. That's, that's yet another positive. So when you're finding common ground with customers like that, it's just a, it's just another reason for, for them to support you. And, and Jake, this is so critical. Your shrewd use of your commitment to sustainability on your menus resonated with your customers and it was part of a touch point that provided an opportunity for a real conversation that they won't be having with your competitors. And there's no, we're never trying to present a magic pill. You, you know, it's like if you can make your race car 2% better, Jason, than every other race car, you don't win 2% more races, you win 100% more races. So I'm not telling business or any of my colleagues, listen, this is going to make a thousand percent difference. It doesn't need to. A two percent difference is a huge difference in competitive business, especially if you know how to use that two percent at critical touch points with your communications or interactions with your customer. That's so important. Absolutely. And we talk about um, different groups making changes. I mean, not not just in the restaurants, but not, not just in paper, but also in packaging. Um, for example, the, uh, the Diwali festival in, um, Surrey several years ago, I think it was three or four years ago, changed it so that, so that there is no more, no more styrofoam is allowed, no more plastic is allowed, you must be using, um, uh, sustainable, uh, and responsibly sourced, uh, packaging for, right. for your products. And that's a big deal. I mean, we're talking about, um, like A&W straws, uh, yeah. you know, matter of fact, they don't even send the straws anymore. Um, but the, the, again, the, the, the change, the change is a common. I, I really believe what we're working on is the inevitable. Yeah. You no, know, I think the traditional incumbents who are out there that are not eco-friendly want to see the inevitable happen maybe 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, and that's okay. But even the traditional incumbents know it's in inevitable. You know, all the automotive sector uh, companies are now making electric hybrid vehicles. You know, 10, 15 years ago, you had a few outliers making electric vehicles. Now everybody's making electric vehicles. And I, I really believe, Jason, that, you know, uh, maybe 20, 30 years from now, you know, with the help of our clients, with the help of advocates like yourself, with environmental leaders that, you know, people are going to walk around society 20, 30 years from now and say, can, can you believe we used to use trees to make paper? Um, I, I really think it's going to be that axiomatic, that truth, that, that absolutely clear to them to say, how were we using trees to make paper when there's an abundance of agricultural fiber waste in landfills or coming from food production that goes to waste that we just don't need to use? Uh, trees. So I, I believe that day's coming. People only make a change into, unless they're educated in, in, in a reason why, or it becomes really uncomfortable. And I'll give you an example. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm from New Brunswick, where right. forestry is a big deal. People are now at the point where they're seeing 
clear cutting in places where, you know, it used to be a nice drive or it used to be between this community and that community and where the land is stripped, stripped to the point where even, even people who years ago would have been, well, my daddy was a lumberjack and this, and, and you know, so-and-so worked in the woods and we support our local business. People are going, what the hell? When they're driving by these, these, these places. And these conversations are starting to come, even, even in a place where forestry uh, and paper and, and, uh, and uh, woodlot, et cetera, is a, a core industry. People are still going, no, 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 no. This is too far with the joke. Now it's becoming painful. And Jason, I want to let you know that we are absolutely supportive of the lumber industry in Canada and North America. We see lumber as a vital resource for furniture, commercial residential construction, decking, siding, fencing, et cetera, for long-term products. Right. But let's be honest, paper and packaging lasts a few minutes, a few hours before it's discarded. For short-term products, let's use agricultural fiber waste and save valuable lumber for long-term products. So we are very for the lumber industry. We just don't think it needs to be used to make paper or packaging, but it can save the valuable lumber for where it's needed most. To speak to that, I mean, even when we talk about valuable lumber for, for furniture and housing, we're at a point now where our, our, our uh, lumber species uh, are, are, are not as high quality as they once were because we've used up so much of this quality product to go into paper. We are, we're now at a point where those, those species aren't what they were 50 years ago. Right. Right. Because we've had to replant, but we're, we're not replanting, uh, as, as strong or as high a quality of product. Right. And, uh, it, again, part of the rationalization from the traditional incumbents may be that they plant trees, for trees that they harvest, but we know through scientific research that mostly monocultures are planted. And you're right, cheaper trees are planted that don't realize maturity. But we see trees as more than just a 30 foot tall piece of lumber. We see them as a vital part of an ecosystem. I'll give you an example. I, I read a study done by a US university, um, a, a sound scientist. Um, so sound, is measured in three components, uh, biophony, geophony, and anthropony. Biophony is the biodiversity of the ecospecies within the forest. Geophony are you know, the sounds from the winds, streams, and anthropony, human sound. So this audio scientist put 21 microphones in a forest before clear cutting. And he took a picture from the highway. And often, as you know, clear cutting happens on the top or in the back. So the visual landscape typically does not get affected by those driving by the forest or walking by the forest. So he planted these 21 microphones in the forest and you could hear the robust sounds of wind, stream, animals, birds, et cetera, humans. After clear cutting, he put the mics back in the exact same spot, no sound the entire ecosystem had disappeared. But the visual impact, Jason, from the highway stayed the exact same. Right. So often people would say, well, nothing really happened. They clear cut, look, nothing happened. But a lot has happened. And I think it's important that we all recognize that a tree is more than a 30 foot tall piece of lumber. It's a vital part of an ecosystem in a community that is harmed by the absence of a tree taking 30 years to grow back. So we're, we're trying to redefine and trying to educate others on this is a new definition of a tree. You can decide what your definition is, but at least here's another opportunity for you to get some more insight on what a tree might be. Yeah, this is, uh, this, this is why I wanted to have this conversation with you because people, people need to be educated. They, also get inspired about making about making these changes and about about making decisions based on on what they've learned we know better we do better um mento thanks so much for for coming on it's uh always a pleasure to talk to you as 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 my friend and also uh on on, on this level to to talk about what you do i'm a huge believer in what you do as you know um, every chance, every chance I get, I tell people about what you do, <laughs> they think I'm in on it. 
Nice. And, and I, I think people like you are, are helping to move that change faster uh, to help to, to really save, um, to save our world. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big statement, but I mean, when we talk about big organizations like government and schools, I mean, who go through mountains and mountains, yeah. and mountains and mountains of paper. I mean, if we stacked it high, it, it, it would blow people's freaking minds, just schools alone. These you're influencing these organizations to make these important changes. And people say, well, uh, why should I do it if so-and-so is not doing it? No, no, no. People are doing it. And, and important organizations are doing it. And gov government organizations are doing it where it counts. And that's because of people like you. It, it's, uh, again, uh, what you do is, uh, oh, is absolutely sure. dispensable. And, and thank you for what you do. And again, thank you for coming on and um, educating and inspiring. And Jason, thank you for having me on, but I've got to tell you one thing before I leave. Please do. I have a lot of help. I have help from leaders like you who help create platforms that offer the opportunity to communicate uh, what we're doing and its relevance to helping others. I have incredible help from government leaders, uh, government professionals, academic leaders, uh, industry leaders. Um, there's no way that one person can do this all by themselves. If we're really gonna create that world where we never use trees to make paper and packaging, I need lots of help. And I'm so grateful that there are so many people who believe in this and are willing to help. And uh, that's the only way positive change is going to become the incumbent uh, you know, standard because I think we can all do this together and we really need to do this together. But thank you, Jason, for having me on. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. You know, you are, before we go, I wanted to make a, a, an opportunity to um, talk about where you're, where you're going to be speaking soon. I mean, you are a, a keynote speaker who gets invited to talk all over the world and all over the country. What's coming up for you? Well, um, in February, I'm speaking on, at, the, at an event with the BC film industry called Axe BC. I'm speaking at UBC coming up on Saturday, February 1st at their Social uh, Entrepreneurship Summit. So it's an exciting opportunity for me to speak with young people who want to go into business and how to integrate sustainability into their new business ventures to uh, add greater value and create a competitive advantage. Um, so there, there's a lot of opportunities for me to uh, share what we've learned and help others um, do something similar as a positive disruption to help not only their business, but the overall goals of society and what's needed. Fantastic. And, uh, and I'm gonna be in Vancouver in February, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch up with you while I'm there. I, Thank uh, you again, Minto. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Minto Roy, uh, managing partner at Social Print. Uh, he can be reached at Social Print. We'll put his contact information uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, it'll be there. If also, if you're watching this on YouTube, like, and subscribe, smash that button again. Thanks Minto. Have a wonderful day. And thanks again for your time. Stay warm, Jason in Calgary. Take oh, care. That's only minus 34 today. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. <laughs>